and show you that in Hebrew I'm a little bit better. Um, I first of all want to introduce myself, then I would like to be focused on Israeli democracy. Um, my uh, grandparents came to Palestine approximately 100 years ago from Russia. Uh, they were young skills. Uh, Zionist, dreamer, idealistics. Um, they dreamt to uh, build a kibbutz in the land of Israel, and their bigger dream was to establish a state for the Jewish people. They built a kibbutz on a rocky mountain with their own uh, ten fingers. The dream of the state remained a dream, and then, after 28 years, in front of their unbelievable eyes, uh, the dream became true, a reality, and the State of Israel was uh, founded. In their eyes, until the day of their death, it was a miracle that happened to the Jewish people that cost with a lot of blood. Their legacy to me, to my mother, that was born in this kibbutz, and myself, I was born in this kibbutz, was that we have to do all our lives the best we can for the State of Israel. So this is me after this very short introduction. I'm a daughter to the Jewish people. I'm an Israeli and I'm a Zionist and by this order. All my life were devoted to the service of the State of Israel. After my uh, serving in the army and studying, for, of course, in the Hebrew University. I served for 25 years in State Attorney's Office in Jerusalem. And uh, I represented the state all over the place, and uh, especially in, for 13 years in the Supreme Court of Justice, in white panels, in criminal, civil, and constitutional issues. Uh, very much focused on military and security issues of the State of Israel. And then after my early retirement in 2004, I was asked uh, by then Prime Minister Ariel Sharon to be a special legal advisor for the government of Israel to prepare a report about the West Bank settlement and especially outpost in the, best, in the West Bank and to show the way to the government of Israel how to solve this problem. So uh, I prepared a report delivered it to the government of Israel in March 2005. Just want you to bear in your mind that the report I wrote, that the government voted to accept its uh, principles. One of the voters was Bibi Netanyahu, current prime minister of the state of Israel. He usually forget it, but I'm usually reminded again and again. Um, after that, I, uh, as you saw, I've heard, gave a course in Tel Aviv University concerning democracy, I had my own law firm, uh, very much active in public life of the State of Israel, including the New Israel Fund, and I'm co-chair of the International Council with Martin Indyk of the New Israel Fund. Uh, everything I did, I count it, everything I did is, to my belief, for the benefit of the State of Israel and to strengthen its force. Um, I would like to say a few words about democracy in general, about the legal status of democracy in Israel, then to be focused on uh, democracy in political in the State of Israel, then to relate a few words about the New Israel Fund, and then a few words in conclusion. So uh, democracy uh, is uh, not a perfect uh, system. You know, we, there is some defects in it but there wasn't fine a better. Um, there are two uh, main aspects in democracy. One is formal and the other is substantial. Formal, it means um, uh, everyone is allowed to uh, vote to, uh, and uh, the other principle is that the elections is uh, happening every period of time. And substantial, it means defending human rights, civil rights, the rights of the majority, and implementation of the principle of equality. And not every uh, democratic state are similar. In some democracy is very strong, in some democracy is weaker. 
we call it a democratic profile of a state. As long as the state has substantial democracy, and a good one, it means its democratic profile is high. As long as a state has only a form of democracy, it means its democratic profile is low. Israel, to my great sorrow, now, nowadays, in these days, its democratic profile is in a reduction. Although in Israel we have a, quite a solid system of democracy, uh, democracy is uh, well a declaration of independence. Although it uh, doesn't call by name democracy, all the elements of democracy are there. You know that the uh, declaration of independence is not a law in Israel, but it reflects the interpretation of laws in uh, all the laws in Israel that uh, court should uh, do. Uh, in our basic laws, that should be future constitution, uh, they repeated again and again that Israel has a democratic, that Israel is a democratic state, and we have an uh, electoral law that uh, the system it represents is a democratic uh, system. So, if you look from above on uh, Israeli uh, legal status of democracy, well, you think it is solid, it exists, it's okay. But when you look what's happening in Israel, then you need to think, well, something is wrong here. Uh, so, to my opinion, there are uh, dark cloud, clouds about, above Israeli democracy, and I want to count to you the reasons and the phenomena that we see now in Israel nowadays concerning democracy. Um, first of all, large parts of uh, Israeli population didn't internalize the idea that democracy is a good thing, is important. Uh, many of them came from non-democratic states, you know, immigrants, they came as adults, it's very difficult to educate an adult people, and you know that democracy is a matter of education. Um, States that are exposed to uh, terror activity, wars, threats on their existence, all the, the, these circumstances always harm the values of democracy. You could see it in your state, you could see it in the United States, in the UK, whatever you look. Israel is exposed to threats for 65, 64 years, and it has its effect on Israeli democracy. Another reason it is that there is no separation in Israel between, no strong separation between the state and religious. It's specific harms uh, women's status. You know that uh, marriage and divorce is according to the halacha law. Um, when one of the main tools of the democratic state to protect their democracy is the constitution. But we in Israel, we don't have a constitution. Um, there is a decision was taken in 1950 not to have a constitution, but to have a basic law that in the future there will be a part of Israeli uh, constitution. Uh, but uh, you know that those laws are very difficult, are very easy to be changed. And the whole point with democracy, that defend uh, the, the basic, uh, the basic um, principles of, uh, of democracy in a state, is very difficult to be changed unless they don't give the protection they need to give. So if it's very easy to change the basic laws, you need only 61 votes out of 120, and every government that have a coalition, and they need to have a coalition of at least 61 votes, so it's very easy to change in a Knesset the law. So this is not a real protection. I'm not getting into the problem of basic law, human dignity and liberty. Uh, this is a specific issue, and I want to go on. If you want, you could ask me a question about it afterwards. Now, another uh, severe problem that we have in Israel that harms democracy is the controlling of the West Bank. Uh, Peter spoke about that. Uh, I'll just say a few words about it. Um, between Israel and the West Bank, there's no border. In the West Bank, there are 340,000 settlers that are living there, among 
six million Palestinians. Um, there are two systems of law that applies in West Bank, one for Israelis and one for Palestinians. The Israelis have all the rights that citizens in a democratic state got, but the Palestinians don't have it. They don't have the political rights to, uh, to elect and to be elect. They don't have or the implementation of their basic rights are very frequently uh, breached. This situation reflects Israeli democracy in many ways. I'm not getting into this. I'm, going, I'm giving a presentation tomorrow about that. But it uh, harm Israeli democracy. Con and this harm is continuous for a long time and it is a destruct in a destructive way. There's another risk that related to what I said until now, to the rule of law, which is a basic stone in democracy. There's a very weak enforcement of the law on Israelis in the West Bank. I was in charge of it in the State Attorney's Office. I know the details. The result is not good. There's a kind of activity defines of settlers against um, uh, the uh, sovereign of Israel that its soldiers need to implement the policy of the government, but settlers sometimes don't like it. And they attack physically the soldiers of the idea. They're price tag. I don't know if you've heard about this expression, price tag in Israel, it means a revenge. What kind of revenge and against whom? It's when the government of the State of Israel do something that the settlers don't like. For instance, if the Supreme Court uh, order instruct the government of Israel to remove an outpost from one place to another, well, the government is not hiring to do that. But when they do that, the settlers wants to make a revenge against Palestinians. And they do that for years in the West Bank. They burn mosques, they burn olive trees, they burn houses, they burn cars, and now it trickles into Israel. And they attack some Palestinian citizens of Israel, peace activists in Israel, and some other religious people, like a slogan that was drawn on a monastery in Latrun, maybe you've heard, and attacks against Palestinians in Israel, like the uh, lynch attempt in Jerusalem, like a Palestinian that escorted his uh, friend to her home, like uh, Palestinian workers in uh, Malchamor that were attacked because they're Palestinians, uh, like a taxi driver that got a bottle, a Molotov bottle on his head, and etc., etc., etc. There is a reduction in the uh, status of the Supreme Court of Justice in Israel. You have to understand that because I'm not getting into it. This is a little bit uh, needs more explanation, but the bottom line is that the Supreme Court is tagged as a player, as an actor in the political field. It tagged like a left wing because it gives an order to the government to remove an outpost, an illegal outpost in the West Bank. So many people in Israel look at the Supreme Court as if it was a part of the left wing, which is in Israel quite a curse. It's not good to be a left wing. We see a phenomenon of anti-democratic legislation in Israel that in many ways, uh, they, maybe you've heard about the boycott law, about the Nakba law, loyalty law, etc., etc. Many kinds of bills, some of them were legislated as laws, but all of them are aimed against forces that are coming with criticism against the policy of the government. They are, they, the laws are against the Supreme Court itself, against the media, against NGOs in Israel that of course they are left, against journalists. We see restrictions on freedom of speech and academic freedom in Israel. 
with just a clue the attempt to close a department in Ben-Gurion University. Well, it didn't succeed yet, it's in a process. There is some uh, demonstrations against that and protests, I'm a part of it. I hope we'll succeed, but there's a tent. And it's a chilly wind to freedom of speech in Israel and in universities especially. There is a situation of uh, exclusion of women in Israel, in buses, for instance, my own daughter, she's a soldier in uh, the IDF, in the Air Force, she sat in front of a bus and she was uh, uh, demanded to stand up and go to the back of the bus, and you know why? It's not a place for women in the front, only men, sorry. Well, I drew to you a quite a dark picture. I'm not getting into details, and I could assure you that there are some more, but I pity you. I don't want to ruin your day, so I stop here. And I want to tell you a few things about the new Israel Fund. The, one of the biggest organizations that are fighting against the whole phenomenon of anti-democratic in Israel is the New Israel Fund. This is the reason I'm there. I'm not only there, I am in many organizations. But I agreed, one and here before, to be a part of them because they fight for Israel democracy. And I believe this is the most important thing today to do. So the NIF was established 33 years ago. Uh, they make a lot of fundraising in the United States and some states uh, out of the United States and in Canada, good for us. Um, the NIF gave to organizations in Israel until today a little bit less than $300 million. Um, the NIF don't only give money. The NIF established the Shatila organization, I don't know if you have heard of this. The Shatila organization is aimed to help organizations to raise up, to grow, and until they're standing on their own legs, the NIF uh, escort them and give them money and instructions and uh, leading and whatever they need. The NIF support uh, social justice. Well, I, I didn't say that the main uh, goals of the NIF is two. One is strengthen Israel democracy and the other is social justice. These are the two flags of the NIF. The NIF support organizations of social justice in Israel, uh, uh, protests for social justice in Israel. For instance, the tent that you've seen in television from last year, from the protests of last year, a part of them the NIF board achievable uh, housing in Israel, uh, rights for minorities, especially Arab citizens of Israel, uh, uh, Russian immigrant Ethiopians, um, residents of the periphery of Israel that needs help, women rights, organizations that are acting f against exclusion of women, organizations that are acting for Jewish pluralism, uh, for uh, chained women and refused divorce certificate women, for uh, rabbis organization that are dealing with uh, sexual harassment, against uh, uh, organization that are dealing against incitement for racism, against price tag, against violence. The NIF has a very strong lobby in the Knesset against the anti-democratic legislation and has some success. In some ways, the NIF succeeded. The International Council that I'm a co-chair of in Israel, we uh, asked many people in the last year to join us. And they accepted the appeal. Uh, we have today, for instance, we're about 80, I can't count all the names, but f one of them is Amos Oz, the novelist. One of them is Aaron Chekhanover, is a Nobel Prize winner. One of them is Danny Kahneman, a Nobel Prize winner. Seven of them are uh, Israel Prize winners. 
There's a lot of very known people in Israel that are active for dem democracy and social justice from universities from many places. We support the NIF, you know that the NIF today in Israel is very severely attacked because the right wing of Israel identify the, the organizations, the NGOs in Israel and the NIF who support them as the real opposition to the government of Israel. Because in Israel today, politically speaking, there's no opposition. The opposition today, it, this is what I mentioned before. And therefore, we suffer a lot of attacks coming from the right. Uh, for me, it proves that we do something. Um, in the end, what I would like to say is these things. Israel is a young state. It's like a startup, if you want, a startup state. On one hand, it's a huge enterprise who did a lot of things because Israel is a wonderful, wonderful state, despite everything I said until now. It's a state that grew out of nothing almost. But on the other hand, there's a lot of things to be improved. I believe that every one of you that came here came because you love Israel. In my opinion, Israel is the homeland of the Jewish people and a democratic state and should be a democratic state that needs to implement the uh, principle of equality and defend its democratic character. Israel as the homeland of the Jewish people is in the interest of every one of you. No matter you live here and not in Israel, this is our, our people, homeland. Israel today is the string that connects between the parts of the Jewish people all over the world. I hope that every one of you will do his best to maintain the state of Israel as the homeland of the Jewish people and a democratic state as it should be, alike unto the nations a moral state, fair, democratic, that caring for civil and human rights where the basic liberties are ensured to all. Thank you. Maya, thank you so much. If, uh, if you could uh, just stay there for... Uh...